So next up is Gillian Williams and Frank Krauss talking about uh, multi-agent modeling. So I'm, I'm going to pitch it off because I, I'm going to be uh, uh, free riding here and uh, throw most of this uh, discussion over to Frank. Um, but I, I just thought I'd, I'd like to give a, um, a quick overview um, of how this sort of started. Um, a long, long time ago, uh, we were told that there might be a pandemic in the UK, and obviously uh, it did happen. Um, and uh, I asked Frank and said, you know, should we try and do something about it? And he was kind of skeptical at first. He was sitting there in his house and he said, hmm, you know, I, I prefer to do the, the work on physics and things. And uh, after a few discussions, he decided to go and talk to uh, some of his uh, PhD students and colleagues at the uh, at our doctoral training center in data, in data science, data intensive science. And um, off he went. And um, thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of uh, supercomputing time later, uh, he came up with what I think is generally regarded as one of the most extraordinary models that uh, of, of the UK in terms of the detail there. And without further ado, I'm going to uh, pass you over to my good friend Frank to talk a bit about this amazing achievement that he's done and uh, give us a little bit about uh, the, the recent part, recent future on it. Thanks a lot. And um, thanks a lot for putting up with me. As, as Julian indicated, I'm a particle physicist, so I will use words that sound horrible to you. And I will use Greek letters because that make me look intellectual, which I, I can assure you I'm not. Um, so Julian indicated already, um, it started a little bit as a hobby project. Uh, Julian quizzed me on something. I want to show my kids what an epidemic is. A couple of uh, days later, I had uh, about nine or 10 PhD students who volunteered to work. Um, their supervisors were very happy that their students did something useful instead of doing astro or particle physics. Um, um, I should say that pretty much every result you see is, res is the result of, um, uh, of the order of 10 students um, working at a level I've never seen before. So I got emails at 3 o'clock in the morning and I started answering them at 7 o'clock in the morning because I, I had to sleep and they already answered then 10 minutes later back. It was completely insane and we did it for about four or five months. So we burned two young lives. And, and this is something I think we should, um, I, I want to stress um, um, that it's pretty extraordinary what you can do with a bunch of eight, nine students who work on the same project. You have a lot of synergy and the guys who are pushing each other at a level I, I've barely seen before. And I'm in the privileged situation of having worked with completely outstanding students in particle physics. So that was another level of, of intensity. Um, what it did was at some point in, in June, or so in, we start in March 2020. In June 2020, we start working with the NHS. And we have been providing um, decision support for them ever since. Um, then the students left because they did their PhD and they went for postdocs and, and other stuff. Um, so we, we scaled down activities, and most of the results I'm going to show you are like the, like the back end of that. Um, so a couple of names, and you see everyone in blue is a, is a student, and everyone in black was pretty much useless. <laughs> um, and that specifically includes myself. I think um, I want to make two exceptions for the uselessness. It's uh, Kevin Fong and Ian Vernon, um, who actually helped us quite a lot in different ways. Um, so what does June do? You can barely read it, but let, him, let me say it's a, it's a large program that simulates epidemics at the, with the example of COVID, of course. Um, and it decomposed into four parts. We have, we have a population model of ridiculous granularity. Um, and that means in the case of the UK, we, we modeled UK and Wales and that put 56 million individual individuals into the computer. So we have the, the names and addresses of 56 million people based on the UK census data, which reports in units of about 250 people on average. So it is so precise that we could see Durham prison and we populated a virtual prison. That, so, so that is what um, I think what is it's, what it's behind that. We have an interaction model, so we kind of trace what people do. Now, the typical thing you hear from computational sociology is that we're all individuals, and that is completely true. I would not dare to simulate 25 people like you or myself because we're all individuals and most of us 
are very individual individuals. Um, but with 56 million people, you talk statistics, 56 million people is a mob, basically. And the, the rule of mob and of, of broad, um, broad numbers and averages starts counting. We have a disease model. And at the moment, our disease model is based on the fact that people infect each other when they are in the same room. And then something bad happens to them if they get infected. And we have a policy module where we can pretty much at the level of individual characteristics change the behavior of people, whether they wear a mask, whether they go to venues, whether we close venues, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is the one slide that I have to show you to remind you that I'm an evil physicist um, because I, I want to contextualize something that we did in the refugee camp that I think is completely, utterly cool. Um, so. Um, the, the infection is probabilistic. Two people in the same room, one is infected, one is not. There's a certain probability that, you know, stuff jumps. This probability is 1 minus an exponential, and you can think of it like a radioactive decay law. So the time matters in which people are in the same room. There's an infectiousness profile, how infectious people are, and that may vary over time. And in the case of COVID, uh, th th you would see a vertical line when you start seeing symptoms, in the case of COVID, what makes COVID such a funny disease is that you're most infectious before you know it. Um, um, so that's the infectiousness. There's the susceptibility of the person who wants to be infected or doesn't want to be infected. And for instance, when you get vaccinated or when you're a child, your susceptibility goes down. And there is a factor that kind of modulates how likely it is that you, that you, that you get it. And this factor depends on the environment you're in, on the kind of group you're in, and in there, there's something called a contact matrix. And that kind of measures how often people are in close enough contact with each other in a certain second, in a certain setting per unit time. Um, so these social mixing matrices typically come from large scale surveys, lots of personal diaries. For example, the BBC Pandemics Project, which I think was conducted in about 2017, 18, they had 80,000 diaries, and they sifted through the diaries to figure out who, has, who of a given age is in contact with someone else of a given age at a given, in a given setting. Um, it's a tricky format because it averages over the full population. So let me give you an example. If you think about the contact matrix between adults and children in schools, they, they, they average over the full adult population of the UK, but not everyone is a teacher. So you have to think about that a little bit. Um, that's problem one. Problem two is this, is this has been done only for the global north. People re, let me call it extrapolated to other countries, but I think we can, we can discuss the quality of extrapolation. And just to give you an idea, in, in June, when, when we talk about households, we have four different categories of people because that's what the census data is. Young children, young adults, basically students living with their parents or so. Adults, which are typically people in, in working age, and old adults, people who are not in working age. So we made certain decisions of what that means in terms of age. We put a very rough matrix into our code, but when you supplement it then with all the kind of beauty of our demograph demographic model, we can now measure in our code what people actually do and how they're in contact with, and we compare with the input data. And you see, I think it's very hard to distinguish in our thing, you see a little bit of a texture, and that is because we had to assume ages, like 65, the, the, and we didn't smooth them out. We could do that, but I think that's not very honest, so that is where we are. We pretty much reproduce what we see with a little bit of edge effects because, well, you know, that's the way it is. Um, if you get infected, different bad things can happen to you. You can be asymptomatic, that's not really bad, and you recover. You can have mild or severe symptoms. You can be hospitalized or have to go to intensive care. And depending on how lucky or unlucky you are, you either rec recover or not. Um, so we filled this with data from the UK. And that was probably the worst data mining exercise of my life. Um, what made it really, really unpleasant was we already knew that um, COVID was burning like wildfire through the care homes. So we had this strong feeling that we should make two different kind of outcome matrices um, for care home population and the non-care home population. 
and that is by H and Sex, because H and Sex are very good proxies in the global north for how well you are. So I'm, I'm a little bit over 50. For me, it starts becoming risky because I start developing diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and all other pleasant and unpleasant stuff. Um, that is typically something with age. Young people typically don't have that. So, so that is how it goes. In, in the global south, and especially in refugee settings that I'm going to talk about in a second, this is obviously not true. So we have to play a couple of tricks there. So the, the tricks, we, so I, I don't want to bore you with how great this was in the UK. Let me just say the NHS is kind of happy and um, Public Health England wants to use our code for future epidemics like annual flu, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's not completely horrible. Um, we, we benefited from the fact that one of our former students um, spent, his, um, spent his internship, his, his placement, with the United Nations in New York, and in fact, he's a, sign, a researcher there. Um, so anyway, um, through him we had, we had a little bit of a contact, and there was a first very quick thing, quick and dirty in 2020, where they tried to talk about Cox's Bazaar, which is the world's largest refugee camp, and what they could do to, to prevent um, half the camp um, keeling over and dying. So Cox's Bazaar sits in the south of, of Bangladesh. Uh, it has about 800,000 um, residents with a population density like New York City. Um, but New York City is three-dimensional. You know, Cox's is two-dimensional. So it's, it's a hotbed. Once, once you have it in the camp, stuff happens. Um, so we adapted our demography, so we had to look at the census data that was provided by the, by the camp management. Instead of households, we have shelters, and sometimes these shelters are shared between more than one family. So you may have two family groupings in two rooms. And um, so that was an interesting thing for our contact matrices. Um, and when we started playing, no one really knew what the contact matrices looked like. No one had even thought about or measured it. And people were very fussy about how much time people spent in different venues. So we asked, um, we asked the camp management to help us. Now, <clears throat> when we did it for the UK, we had 80,000 diaries and we had fantastic data from the ONS. Super duper nice. This doesn't work in refugee camps, not at all. So you need to do something very quick, and you have to be, you have to be hopeful that you ask the right question. So we found in, in Cox's Bazaar what you, don't, what you don't quite see, maybe I see it on the next one now. Um, Cox's Bazaar has of the order of 20 subregions, and for each of these subregions, we asked of the order of four people. So ultimately, we had of the order of 300 people, um, Two men, uh, sorry, one, one man, one woman, um, two, chi two children of different, uh, of different sex, um, and we asked them, how many adult children have you seen in a certain set of venues? Like your, your shelter, latrines, distribution centers, the mosque, etc., etc., etc. It's a very, very rough, it's a very rough um, thing. And for instance, what you see is, as a contact matrix in a shelter, this is for a two-family shelter. How many contacts do you have with your own family in the two groups and across the families? Um, so we plug that into, into our model, and we produce the first ever contact matrices for a refugee camp. Um, now, it, it's great if you have an agent-based model, but agent-based model cost, cost CPU time. If you want to do something quick and dirty, you do some kind of analytic models like these SEIR models. I'm fairly certain everyone played with them when, when COVID hit us on, on their little Excel spreadsheet. If you want to do it a little bit smarter than just, you know, you're either ill or not, and you want to check about age, or, uh, age et cetera, you need these social contact matrices. That's why they're so highly cited. But they didn't exist for refugee camps, so, so we did something very quick. Um, you see, again, textures. Um, there's a texture at 18 between, um, say, children, teenager, and adult, and there's another texture, texture that you can barely see at 12, because one thing that we didn't do, and I think we should do, is there are behavioral, massive behavioral difference between males and females in the camp, 
because the, the males of the, over the age of 12 go to the mosque and the females don't. So, so this is something for, for future work. Anyway, we produced, uh, we produced these matrices and um, the publication is uh, being put together for that. Um, and then we had to think about um, how do we deal with the fact that, you know, that the, that the COVID impact will be different. And the first thing you realize is um, lots of these people have a completely different set of comorbidities and it hits them typically harder than us uh, because um, um, medical, medical supplies, etc., and medic and healthcare in the camp. I mean, honestly. So, so we had, we have, we did some kind of rescaling by saying, well, actually, if you have certain a certain comorbidity at a given age and sex, we took numbers, we took numbers from the UK, and we have some risk multiplier. It's typically an integer number, one, two, or three. So, if you have a cardiovascular disease, your chance is three three times increased to end with a severe, with a severe ailment, i.e. you have to go to, to the hospital. And we have an overall scaling that we fit to data. The other thing is we have to count for the fact that the, um, that the um, life expectancy of the population in the camp is different from the UK. So we made a very simple model by saying, well, there is a threshold age until, until which the human body repairs itself. And from my own experience, it's about 30, 35 or 40. You nick yourself a little bit, you plead. Two days later, you can't remember. I, do, I play a little bit of sports today. I hurt for three days. So my body doesn't repair itself anymore, not at the, at the same rate. So we have this threshold idea that up to a certain age, everything is hunky-dory. And if you're over that age, you're honestly not. And if you're over that age, we rescale with the remaining life expectancy. So simply put, in the UK, say the average life expectancy is 80, and in the camp it's 70. If this threshold, threshold age is 40, then three years in the camp count as, four, count as four years. So basically, you push yourself to the right of this beautiful, colorful, colorful plot of how bad you're being hit. So we did that. Then we seeded our infection somewhere in the northeast because we knew this is where it was imported. And then you see how over time May August and November, you see the percentage or the, the ratio of people being actively infected, and it's a beautiful wave that went through the camp. And then, of course, with a couple of weeks delay, uh, you see the aggregated death. So that is, uh, that is what it does. Um, we are not happy with the fit. The fit is not good enough yet for us to, to publish. Um, you can barely see it, but what it does is the following. We checked for different variants of um, if we see the infection completely localized or not, in how far we constrain, how far people travel to the mosque, and we, we put some limits that you can't travel from one end of the camp 20 kilometers or however much to the next mo to the mosque, but you go to only a certain amount of time. So, so we put certain restrictions, and that is the best fit we have. And, um, so it looks quite okay, and then it doesn't anymore, but that's fine because that's delta kicking in, and we haven't seen the delta. Um, the one thing that was a complete nightmare was to try to estimate the excess deaths because they didn't have really, at times, any idea about who died of COVID or not because the camp was locked down. So we, we basically estimate as, um, the excess deaths based on previous years. We have two spikes that we don't quite understand. And all in all, I think we, we start the seeding a little bit too late. But other than that, you know, it's good enough, I think, for governmental work. Um, so, and that is uh, pretty much where we are. Um, let me just say, coming from physics, um, epidemiology is an interesting field of science. It started about 100 years ago, like quantum mechanics. Um, we have smartphones now, just saying. Um, so, so there is a lot to be done, I think. Um, we have a model that is um, ridiculously granular in all possible aspects. We pay a price for that. <clears throat> a, year, a year of infection in the UK costs a day on a supercomputer with 30 cores and um, 100 gigabyte memory, which is okay because we do physics, so large-scale computing is what we love. Um, <clears throat> a year in the camp is, a, is six hours on my laptop. Completely doable. Um, um, 
The court is highly flexible, so it is absolutely not a problem to put new infectious diseases. We, we just need the data for that. If the infection and transmission way is the same as in the case of COVID, people in the same room, it's a complete walk in the park. No problem whatsoever, really. New effects, new strains, um, new policies, not hard to implement. New environments, yeah, it hurts a little bit because you have to get the geography and the democ demography right. We played a little bit with adapting to Germany, but the German census completely sucks. It's not as good. Um, and um, I th the thing I like, I like best is um, there's this widespread perception in computation and sociology that these models don't help you, really, because they're only qualitative. And I think, I'm happy to say that I think it's wrong. Um, in, in, the, in the case of the UK, we found that at some point after lockdown, we didn't kill enough of our virtual old people because they got decoupled from anything. You know, they stayed at home, it was lockdown, they don't work, there was nothing there. So <clears throat> in the beginning, we pushed it into the care homes, but then the care home numbers came out and we couldn't do that anymore. And then we realized that we forgot to implement in our code that in the UK, 250 million hours of domestic care are being given. And that connected the older part of the population again to infected people and everything was fine. So I think one of the things I want to advertise is if you have large scale populations, think of something like 500,000, a million people. Um, if you get the physical reality of this population roughly correct, you will be able to make quantitative forecasts. You'll be able to quantitatively understand the past, which can inform what you think about the future. And I think that is something, um, I think we have some constructive proof of that, which I think is, is the one take home message here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for that overview, overview there. We have time for one question. So do you have a relationship um, continuing with UNHCR? Uh, yes. Um, I, I should say that, um, so our, our student Joe Bullock is still at United Nations Global Pulse. Um, just yesterday I had a conversation actually with someone from UNHCR who made the survey on which we base our, our um, contact matrices. And we realized, um, I mean, we realized before, but we confirmed that um, going by age alone is not good enough. And we were tossing ideas around to compare with another camp in Kampala or around Kampala. And um, we hope that we can go also to Poland and check there. Um, that's number one, I think. The other thing I would like to say is, um, if you do this thing with, with geog um, for, for our Cox's Bazaar thing, we have a very good handle of the geography. For, for camps like the ones in Poland now, I think we don't do that, really. So we have the, the idea to use um, satellite data to identify, say, tents, so to say, according to, to their functionality. And we, I think we already have some ideas of how to do that. So my, my hope is that we will, with our contacts in the UN, to provide a toolkit where we can have rapid turnovers for, for all possible epidemics hitting the camps. Um, yeah, it's a hope, you know. Okay, thank you very much.